Our next speaker is Draken. Um, take it away. Thanks. Oh, uh, I have I have some slides. Are you going to put those up too? Yeah. Cool. Um, should I just start talking? Yep. You're okay. Good. Uh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Draken, and this is my talk, "The Roguelike Spirit Without Procedural Generation." Through the writing of this talk, I started to kind of come up with an alternate name: How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Low Value Factors. And so if you're familiar with uh, the Berlin interpretation, it's a collection of these factors that are kind of used to try and define what a roguelike is. And in kind of a fit of creative rebellion, I, I, was, I was thinking, what if I took what is assumed to be the core of the roguelike, which is procedural generation. Um, and here in my slides, random environment generation and permadeath, I was kind of like, what if I took those out? what remains about a roguelike that's beautiful without these things? And just for, just for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to cut it down right just to the six low value factors. And the low value factors, they tend to be, I mean, it's just in the name, they're low value. They're kind of presumed to be less important. Um, and the way I'm going to talk about these is I'm just going to pair them off and uh, each pair is going to make a concept. So the first concept I want to talk about is the feeling of simulation and embodiment that I get out of having a single player character and having the monsters be similar to the players. And what this does is in a game like The Sims where I am not really an individual in the world, I can't feel like I am a part of the world. And when, when I'm treated as special as a player in the eyes of the world, Again, it's, it's not like I'm part of the world, it's like I am above it in some way. So a game I really like that's not a roguelike that I think does this is Ernog Unlimited. And in this game, it's not, not, it's not so much that the monsters are similar to the players as much as all the entities are kind of similar to each other. So there is a teleporter that will transport anything that lands on top of it into the save room. And the save room is kind of this hub, uh, but... Uh, the save, room, the save room is kind of this very important hub. And so you can drop a block down there. There's gems and stuff. You can drop money into the save room to save it. But monsters are similar to blocks in this game. And so you can drop them into the save room as well. And then when you go into the save room, it's all kinds of trouble because there's these monsters now in your save room that is kind of presumed to be the safe place. And similarly, the way you go to the save room is you are just like the monsters and blocks, a physical object. So when you land onto the save room teleporter, it teleports you to the save room in exactly the same way. And I love how this simple interaction of treating everything the same way is such a core conceit of this game. And um, this idea of kind of like a pure real simulation where everything is mechanically simulated. There's no invisible walls or fake doors. It's all the rules of the game. And really, this is something that, although I see it in other games now, and it's something I look for a lot, I first noticed it in traditional roguelikes. And I like looking at the Berlin interpretation because it reminds me of kind of traditional roguelikes feel like a very pure expression of this pure simulation of a world that is made up of its mechanics. Second, I want to talk about the uh, monolithic challenge. The monolithic challenge is exemplified for me in, I would say, I think NetHack was my first roguelike. And the way NetHack frames the challenge is, there is this dungeon and at the bottom of it, there is the amulet of Yendor, at least as far as I remember. It's been a while since I've played it. And this is very common in most roguelikes and you know, of all definitions of roguelike is the idea that you're going to start at the beginning every time and you as an individual are going to conquer this singular challenge. It's a whole thing. It's not an episodic game that you play, or episodic, it's not an episodic game you play chapter by chapter. When you when you load up a, a an episodic game in the middle somewhere, you don't have to worry about the beginning of the game. Those are challenges that you've already dealt with. But in a roguelike, when you come when you come to it again, you're really always starting from the beginning, and it feels like a, a whole thing that you are trying to to master. So I want to talk about Below because I think it is a game that, to me, 
aesthetically exemplifies this whole monolithic challenge extremely well. You can see in my slide that there's just a gigantic mountain with a doorway in it. And every time you die, you get kicked out to this kind of like beach mountain overworldly place. And every time you come up to the same mountain and it's just such a distinct feeling of this is, this is the challenge, you are beginning it. And at some point there's going to be an end and it's just you and the challenge. And I wanna talk about Dark Souls too, because uh, while below is procedurally generated, there, there is a way to get this monolithic challenge feeling in other games. Uh, there's also arcade games, like the games where you would always start from the beginning and um, you have to get through them with a certain number of lives. A lot of old games had this kind of monolithic challenge feeling, and as that faded away, roguelikes really held the torch. But I think Dark Souls has glimmers of this. Each bonfire is its own sort of beginning of many monolithic challenges, but the unforgiving nature of a run where you start and you know there's there's however many enemies laid out before you and it is just a, a singular task that you get to repeat and master until um, you know you've solved it. And although it is not a procedurally generated monolithic challenge in the way that an entire roguelike is, it still gets at a heart of this aesthetic for me. Uh, so my third concept is this focus, and I think this I think all these tie into each other. But this one ties in, ties especially strong into the simulation. ASCII display and numbers are a way to boil down the presentation of a game so that as a developer and also as a player of this type of game, you're free to focus more on just the mechanics and what they say. This is a game called Syncopaus, and although it doesn't actually literally have any ASCII display or numbers. It's extremely roguelike similar as far as I can tell, as far as I know, I mean, I played it. Um, you can see that the player character has three out of five little bubbles of health underneath. And this is something that is not a digit that's displayed on the screen, but it's still, it has, it has me as the player thinking in the language of numbers. I'm not think I'm thinking about, I have three out of five health, the numbers, and the data of the game are very apparent. And it definitely does not have an ASCII display. It has actual graphics. Um, I really like the ASCII display, as I'll get into, but you can see that there's a frog enemy and a lizard enemy. And these enemies aren't different in, any, in, in the ways that a frog or a lizard are different in real life. They're purely iconic. The frog is just, is just an icon. It stands in for the enemy with three health points. And the lizard is just the enemy with two health points. And there's other things about them, but really nothing about them is frog-like or lizard-like. I really have a fondness for pixel art. Really low resolution pixel art is appealing to me in much the same way that ASCII art is because of the way it's, it's something that you interpret. It, it shows you only what's necessary. And in, in a roguelike, a G might be a goblin. And so you quickly, you know, you interpret that G and you learn the language of the game. And that's the game telling me as a player, that's the game telling me as a player that uh, a lot of the other fluff doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter how tall or short the goblin is. The goblin is just a goblin. And the, the at symbol, the at symbol representing the player is to me just this perfect example of boiling away everything that doesn't matter to the experience. Uh, the at symbol doesn't give me the player an idea of what my avatar looks like or where they come from because it's telling me these things don't matter. What matters is what I'm capable of and what I do. Um, so that's pretty much the end of the talk. I went over those three concepts, made up these low value factors, and I want to really push the idea, like I wanna, I wanna make it clear that I'm not saying these things are the only concepts that are beautiful about traditional roguelikes, but it was a really fundamental exercise to look at the roguelike, something that from traditional roguelike fans to roguelite fans, everyone seems to agree that the procedural generation is at the heart of what a roguelike is. 
but I think that there's a lot of fascinating combinatorial aesthetics that come out of all these little pieces of the Berlin interpretation. Um, and I'm a fan of the Berlin interpretation in this way. Uh, I'm actually in the theater holding the Berlin interpretation object. Um, and so we've put up a, a little gif of a game that I'm working on, which is absolutely not a roguelike, but I really loved calling it a low value roguelike because it, it captured the essence of this like weird essence of what a roguelike is, like what I really love about roguelikes. Um, it's called Handmade Death Labyrinth Issue Zero. I made it with my friend John Malloy, who's in the audience as well. Uh, and if you're curious about it at all, I will be hanging out at the at, si at sign statue area for a, for a while. Uh, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. So <laughs> many cool games that have like these little bits of, of roguelike in them. Yeah. Um, cool. We are 